Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about the respective roles of politicians and civil servants in the executive government of the United Kingdom. In fact, this is a huge topic and I'm only going to touch on a couple of themes that I think are interesting. As you know, the major government departments are headed by a political head, a minister who in most cases takes the title of Secretary of State. For example, the Secretary of State for the Home Department is the head of the Home Office. The Home Office, as you may know, deals with a number of policy areas, including immigration and passports, drugs policy, crime, fire, counter-terrorism and police. But the Home Office, like other ministerial government departments, has another head known as the Permanent Secretary, who is a civil servant. At the time of filming, the Permanent Secretary in the Home Office was Matthew Rycroft, who was appointed to this role after the resignation of the previous Permanent Secretary, Sir Philip Rutnam. Permanent Heads of Department, as Permanent Head Secretaries are also known, are so called because whilst ministers come and go in response to changing political circumstances, such as elections, cabinet reshuffles and other contingencies, permanent secretaries remain. And traditionally this has been regarded as one of the strengths of the civil service. They provided detailed knowledge of the working of departments on the basis of which they can advise ministers, who by their nature are temporary holders of political office and usually lack such in-depth knowledge of the working of their departments and other areas of expertise. So one question we might ask is what is the relationship between the minister, the political head and the permanent head who is a civil servant and how does this relate to the relationship between politicians and civil servants more generally? So one question that we might ask is what is the relationship between the minister, the political head of the department, and the permanent secretary who is a civil servant? Now we could answer this question by outlining the respective roles of the minister and the permanent secretary. We could say things like it is the minister who is constitutionally responsible to parliament for the work of the department while the permanent secretary is the accounting officer who signs off in the expenditure incurred in the department, and so on. But at the end of the day, while informative, such a delineation of specific responsibilities doesn't get us very far towards understanding the underlying principles that govern the relationship between politicians and civil servants. An alternative starting point to understand the traditional relationship between politicians and civil servants would be to look at those rare statements of principle that the government itself has produced. One such starting point would be the 1918 report of the Committee on the Machinery of Government, known as the Haldane Report after its chairman, Viscount Haldane, who at different times also served as Lord Chancellor. Believe it or not, the Haldane Report is still the most recent comprehensive look at the role of the civil service in the Constitution. The Haldane Report was concerned with improving the efficiency of government against a background of the growth of the administrative state and the increasing complexity of the task of government. To meet these challenges, the report argued, a deeper partnership was required between ministers and civil servants. Modern government required the continuous acquisition of knowledge and the prosecution of research in order to furnish a proper basis for policy. The process of knowledge acquisition was not something that ministers alone could do, nor, it was argued, could civil servants. Hence the recommendation of a model of partnership in which ministers decide after consultation with their permanent officials. This has become known as the Haldane Principle, and it is often taken to stand for the idea that the relationship between ministers and civil servants is indivisible. There was not, nor should there be, a separation of powers between ministers and civil servants. And it should be remembered that the idea of partnership extended not just to the permanent secretary and a few senior officials, but it should be extended throughout whole departments. 
ministers provided the authority that comes from being politically elected, while civil servants provide the competence. It wasn't always like this. In fact, at common law, civil servants are servants of the crown, and as such were dismissible at pleasure. So the position in strict law was precisely the opposite of what was seen in practice, which was that civil servants enjoyed very stable careers. Nowadays, of course, civil servant recruitment and employment is supervised by the Civil Service Commission, a statutory body. But it is still worth asking, how do we see the evolution of this difference between the position as it was in law and what we observe in practice? Now, one answer to that question, which was first given, as far as I know, in the case of New Zealand, in a 1947 book by Leslie Lipson called The Politics of Equality, was that this arrangement was based on a kind of accommodation, or as Lipson puts it, a mutually beneficial bargain between politicians and civil servants. This was given effect by New Zealand's Public Service Act of 1912, as Lipson puts it, with the political parties, the modern New Zealand civil service has struck a mutually beneficial bargain by guaranteeing to public servants a life's career and a pension. Parties have forsworn the use of patronage and have guaranteed to the state's employees their tenure of their jobs. In return, the parties expect and the public servants owe equal loyalty to any government which the party have placed in office. The same sort of accommodation was argued by Bernard Schaeffer to have emerged in Britain in the 19th century. Schaeffer, interestingly enough, became a professor in the Institute of Development Studies here at Sussex shortly after it was founded in 1966. In Schaeffer's account, in return for agreeing to anonymity, some sacrifice of political rights and pol proficient performance, British civil servants were given prominent careers, honours and a six-hour working day when the middle classes wanted just that and neutrality was possible, credible and inexpensive. To summarise, under the accommodation that Lipson and Schaeffer described, Politicians gave up the traditional power of hiring and firing civil servants at will, and they offered to civil servants a number of privileges, including the privilege of being at the central source of advice to ministers on matters of state. In return for this, civil servants were expected to set aside their own personal political views and offer loyal and proficient advice to the government of the day of whatever po political colour. And while civil servants were forbidden from speaking out on political matters, they were also shielded from blame when things went wrong. They were protected by the convention of anonymity of civil servants, under which the ministers, rather than civil servants, spoke on behalf of their departments. This extended to taking the blame when things went wrong. Both Lipson and Schaefer speak of the benefits of this accommodation, both to politicians and to civil servants, as well as implicitly to the public who benefit from the fruits of the partnership in terms of more effective policy making. But this highly complicated bargain, as Schaeffer saw it, was not without its problems. Ministers shuffle out of their part of their bargain, the demands of proficiency improve, and even British civil servants no longer get their old guaranteed ration of honours. Civil servants, too, can shuffle out of their duties of competence and loyalty to the government of the day. They have sometimes been accused of being disloyal or insufficiently supportive of government's policy objectives or lacking necessary competence. It is in this context that I think some of the criticisms that have been made of the present government of Prime Minister Johnson are interesting from a constitutional point of view. For example, in a recent blog post on the UK Constitutional Law Association blog, Rodney Brazier accuses the government of contempt for the Constitution. Whether that is a fair accusation to level at them is not my concern here. Rather, what I think is interesting is that Brazier is basing his accusation in the undeniable fact that senior civil servants are resigning at almost as great a rate as ministers. 
This would seem to go against the principles of anonymity and permanence of officials. Of course, if anyone was minded to defend the government against these criticisms, they might equally argue that civil servants had not lived up to their end of the bargain. Omni-shambles like the A-level results fiasco might indicate a lack of proficiency on the part of the civil servants. But either way, it shows that the traditional public service bargain is under threat. As I noted at the outset of this mini-lecture, I have only really touched on the constitutional position of civil servants and its relationship with political heads of department. This is a big subject, but I hope you are now familiar with some of the key ideas. In particular, I hope I have conveyed a sense of the traditional symbiotic relationship between politicians and civil servants, and how this has been argued by some scholars to have been based on a mutually beneficial bargain. In a recent article that I co-wrote with Martin Lodge, and which was published in the Northern Ireland Legal Quarterly, I argued that, partly as a result of the legacy of Crown Colony rule, such a mutually beneficial bargain never emerged in Jamaica, and this has been one of the problems that has afflicted post-colonial development and state building. Instead, what we saw there was the emergence of a mutually suspicious bargain that failed to resolve tensions between the constitutional principles of representative and responsible government. If you're interested in digging deeper, you can have a look at that article. This is presumptively the last of my pre-recorded videos for public law. Unless something changes in relation to coronavirus measures that compels a move to online-only teaching, all my lectures after reading week will be blended synchronous lectures. I hope you've enjoyed this series of pre-recorded mini-lectures. In the meantime, I'll see you in class. But for now, goodbye.